episode of Dolce Vita, have a taste of the latest gastronomic sensation in Hong Kong, the K Cuisine. Check out some stylish new shades that turn you into a K pop idol. Appreciate South Asia's exotic beauty through art. And visit a place where travel, food, and culture meet. Food is a necessity of our lives, but apart from giving us enough nutrients and energy to thrive, food is also a source of enjoyment. Absolutely. Eating the food you love is an indulgence, and sometimes eating certain foods will bring back great memories. For example, I remember when I was a little girl in Canada, we would go ice skating and then afterwards, me and my cousins would go eat poutine at the small food kiosk near the rink. And you know, this very Canadian comfort food always brings back great memories. I feel that way sometimes too, but to me, the pleasure that food brings goes beyond palate sensation. It can also help us understand a certain gastronomic culture and its related history. Many of us are no strangers to Japanese food. Still, apart from the typical sushi and ramen, you can also find a taste of Japanese flavor with Nikkei cuisine, a unique cultural cuisine developed in the late 19th century that blends Japanese flavor into Peruvian food. Uh, Nikkei cuisine basically in Peru uh, started 50 years ago, and the thing is between pure Japanese uh, technique, but then it started to use uh, Peruvian flavors like a uh, chili, a bit more sour facts, a little bit salty, uh, that exotic fact that have Peru, so makes something really interesting. I try to work most in the Peruvian style and technique with uh, Japanese touches, like use really nice wasabi, which is intense, and the technique of Japanese cuisine, and also twist a little bit more. So my cuisine Nikkei in Hong Kong it's more the other way around of the coin, like more Peruvian technique with a Japanese touch, different than we have in Peru. What I do here with La Causa is approach what is traditional from Peru, mix it up with a little bit technique of uh, Nikkei cuisine or Japanese as a tempura. So Causa basically is a cold potato mash. In this case, I'm dressing up with a lime juice, and also chili, and then beetroot juice and then topping with a spicy chili mayo, also topping with a brown tempura and brown tartar. So those two have a both technique, Japanese and Peruvian, and combine really nicely. The tuna tartar is bound to be a crowd pleaser. Chef Arturo first used soy citrus to marinate the raw tuna and then pairs it with diced watermelon. The citrusy flavor balances perfectly with the natural sweetness of the watermelon. The appetizer gives the meal a refreshing start. Mm. This tuna tartar combines tuna, avocado, watermelon, and citrus. The combination of flavors really complement each other, making it particularly refreshing, a perfect appetizer. You're right, it's absolutely delicious. And if you're a seafood lover like us, then you're in for a treat because fish plays a starring role in traditional Nikkei cuisine. Peru, we use seafood a lot, same as Japanese, but in different ways of seasonings, no? because same as Japanese, in Peru we eat raw fish. But in the time in Japan, mostly it's wasabi and soy sauce. In Peru, it's more focused on chili, lime juice, uh, onions, garlic, intense flavors. So what I try to do here is combine both technique and have something approach. For example, if a uh, seafood plate have or missing some spicy, instead to use uh, Peruvian chilies, I will go ahead for Japanese wasabi to balance in the flavors. Peruvian cuisine is a lot more than just ceviches. Peruvian barbecue is something you can't miss too. Here, the chef grilled the rump steak with a sauce that is made from garlic, chili, and cumin, giving the meat a spicy and flavorful kick. One of my signature dishes of this collection will be octopus is black. 
Before I was having octopus, a skewer. Now I have a beautiful octopus, black color because I use charcoal oil with a flavor of chutney, like an Indian chutneys, no? and intense uh, flavors like Peru, Latino, of lime juice and little chili. This octopus is grilled, uh, marinated in anticuchera sauce, which is traditional from Peru. After grilled, we just brush with charcoal oil and garnishing with a pineapple chutney. What defines a good meal goes far beyond just the flavor, culinary skills, and presentation. The story behind each dish is what keeps us wanting more. Sunglasses may be a small accessory to you, but I think they have a large impact on your face, your look, and your style. I think Korean pop star have done a really good job in this part. I would like to become a Korean pop star, but you know, we cannot change anything at this moment yet. But I know a fun and creative way to recreate this fantasy, which is dressing up like a Korean pop star with a sunglasses. Korean pop stars are famously known for dressing with something really sharp that wows the crowd. Even the accessory they use need to be really eye-catching too. Look at this one. I really like the combination of the blue and white. See that? The two lenses join together by a semicircle and form a triple circle illusion. Imagine you walking on the street with this eyewear. Actually, I think everyone is going to focus on your eyewear immediately. If that was a bit too much to you, then these sunglasses might be another option. Let's talk about the design first. I really like this cat eye design and look at both corners come with different colors, such as yellow and this one is pink. It depends on your personality, right? Let me tell you a secret. When I pick my favorite sunglasses, actually, I would like to pick a bigger lens, like this one. Check out this accessories area. You can find all different kinds of sunglasses accessories. Oh, look at this one. And uniform shape decoration. I think it's kind of a earring. And also this part attached to your sunglasses. Uh, do I look like a K-pop star right now? Oh, this one. This one is even cooler, I think. That one is more modern and this one is more sporty. Even the material is different. The design is similar to the wide back clip suspenders. If you attach to your sunglasses and you wear it, this part turned out to be a necklace. What a surprise. Let's head up to the second floor. There should be plenty of styles and models. Let's take a look. Speaking of the design, I have never thought about putting matches into an eyewear design. Look at this one I'm holding. The frame mimics the appearance of the matches. This is something absolutely I would like to wear it whenever I go. Whoa, let's take a look on this one. It attracts me immediately. This rectangular shape frame is definitely the spotlight of the design. It accentuates with an uncut clear lens. The combination of the uncut and cut lenses come together to emphasize. Look, I think you don't have to dress up nice to impress because these sunglasses can do the job nice and sharp. All the sunglasses models we checked were all about the design, but this one is a bit different. Not only the design is special, but the red color also makes the style looks really catchy. This crazy looking sunglasses is a must-have item for any fashion misters. After checking all the sunglasses models, I think I know what to bring to attain the upcoming fashion events next time. 
after the break, be mesmerized by art pieces from South Asia. And have a taste of new world cuisine. From Chinese contemporary art, to the iconic polka dot art from Japan, to the monochrome painting movement in South Korea, Asian art has become the center of attention in the international art scene. I'm sure many of us are no strangers to the artists and creatives from our neighboring countries across Southeast and Northeast Asia. Yet the diverse art and cultural scene doesn't just stop there. There are many more to be explored from the untapped territories in Asia. Let's hear what Fabio Rossi, a gallerist with a great passion in Asian art and culture, has to say about these beautiful art pieces from Pakistan and Iran. I understand that both creators are from Islamic Asian countries and then were settled in Western countries. So what is the cultural significance of their work? Um, yes, both artists moved to the West in the early 60s. Rashid moved to London in 1964 and Sia moved to Minneapolis in 1960. Um, and they kind of created work despite being ignored for the most part, particularly Rashid. And the work is now so significant that I consider among the most important artists of the 20th and 21st century. So I think they really represent a bridge between East and West and the fact that they show that artists from non-Western countries can become part of the canon of modern and contemporary art. So how have the creators' past experiences shaped the creation? For Rashid, it's really an interest in geometry and abstraction and movement. More recently, kind of reconnecting in the last two decades with his Islamic roots by looking at Islamic uh, geometry and architecture. Their practice has evolved and they never stuck to one particular type of artwork. And so in the case of C, I think is really the interest that he had in poetry, in philosophy, in architecture. So for example, if you look at this work of Sia from 1957, he's 17-year-old, he's really using um, the material in a very interesting way, but he's creating an architecture of uh, shape. He's basically um, he's echoing the cafe in Tehran where people would sit down and talk about poetry, talk about art, but also talk about politics. Yes, that's very interesting. So how have the creators expressed their thoughts through art? Well, apart from doing through those type of works, I mean, those are, of course, the work is the most important part of any artist. Both of them have also been in, in, uh, very involved in, in writing. Uh, Sia wrote a very seminal manifesto for public art in 1970, which is now, you know, is considered one of the most important uh, texts on the subject. And then and Rashid, on the other hand, started a magazine called The Blip Phoenix in the late 70s in London. And when that folded, uh, he started another magazine called The Third Text. And both magazines became the forum for uh, writers, poets, activists, artists from non-Western countries, uh, a place where they could publish their work. If you were to choose a piece that is the most aesthetically pleasing, which one would that be? Well, I think I would choose this piece by Rashid Arayin, Cubist Sculpture. This is a, a piece that was first conceptualized in 1966. There is a drawing in the publication, published many times, that is now in the collection of the Tate Modern. So in the 60s, Rashid was conceptualizing a lot of this artwork, but never really fully realizing because he didn't have the economic finances to do it. And it's a very simple work. There are 12 cubes. Each of them are the same dimension, but each of them looks similar, but in fact, it, they're all different. The difference is, is made by the uh, diagonal which dissects the cube. It's, it creates movement. It really creates a situation where each uh, piece while you walk around become a different piece and you become as a viewer a participant of the work. This piece is so thought-provoking. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about it? In the 1980s and 90s, Rashid created about 20 of these type of works that are called cruciform series. You have four panels at the corner, and then you have um, the other five panels that make a cross. So immediately you have the first reference to, in a way, Christianity, the West, with the idea of using the cross. 
but then you also have the panels which are most of the time painted green which echo and reference Islam. What you see here is, um, is a photograph of a bull, a sacred animal for the Hindu, but if, interesting enough is a bull that is destined for a sacrifice during a Muslim festival. So you have a, again a dichotomy between two cultures, the Hindu and the Muslim, and, and then you have the use of Hurtu. The influence of the West into the East is what Rashid is commenting about, is uh, influence that was very strong in the colonial period, but it's, even, it's still strong in this post-colonial uh, period that we live in. Can you tell us more about Sia's view on public art? At the time it was very much influenced by the writing of um, the 19th century American philosopher. Uh, we don't want art for the rich or the poor. We want to find art, a, a, a common cultural ground that is for everyone. And I think the bridges are really the most important metaphors of his, uh, of his work in that sense because the bridges represent a point, point of exchange, a point of union. And so that's the, the, the best expression of his public art project, I believe. Laced with symbolic meanings and incredible stories, the artwork here showcases not just the creator's artistic skills, but also the cultural significance of their work, taking art appreciation to the next level. Sometimes I think I'm a travel junkie. You know, the joy of meeting. The base cooking is sort of French orientated from both of our backgrounds. And then as we travel through Asia and through South America, we bring ingredients, flavors, ideas back and we infuse those with the base cooking that we've had from our training, along with the ingredients from our travels. Uh, last year, myself and Chris, we took a trip to Japan. One of our suppliers took us there and showed us around the island, and one of the suppliers we went to see was a pork farmer. So we went to see all the pork in the farm and to see how the bread and the food they're eating, which gives them the great flavor. Then we went to see the abattoir, and then we also could see the different parts of the animals, which is when we chose the pork loin, because it has great fat content, uh, great meats and the sort of you know the flavor the marbling in the meat so when you cook it it gives a nice juicy texture this is why we service at the restaurant and then we can showcase to the customers where the products come from after pan frying the tender and juicy pork loin is served with the charred tomato sauce a tamarind reduction sauce as well as deep fried pork rind what a playful and flavorful combination Uh, we like to take something that's um, humble, like a potato, a piece of asparagus, and try to elevate that um, to a really high level and also bring in bold flavors. Uh, for example, on our spring menu asparagus dish, we've used preserved lemon, which is a really, really bold, um, salty lemon. Uh, we use that in an aioli to just really bring up as much flavor as we can to accent whatever vegetable we're using. Asparagus is naturally a nutrition-packed vegetable that offers a good source of fiber and vitamins. But what takes this nourishing plant to the next level is the thoughtfully curated flavor combination. The poached egg and pumpkin crumble match perfectly with the asparagus, and the rich and creamy lemon aioli sauce offers a heroic flavor boost to the dish. Mmm, the dish is incredibly delicious. Something that will wake up into is a great way to showcase the chef's culinary skills and his creativity. And this delicious dish of maitake mushroom has made its point. With the spice delicious Sichuan glaze and the sweet and sour pineapple salsa, we even sprinkled the manchego cheese all over the mushroom. Every bite is heavenly. Although the combination of different flavor profiles might seem like they're all over the place, once you tuck into it, you will notice that there's a nice balance between the sweet, sour, and spicy, making this a succulent dish. If you prefer your dessert to not be overloaded with sweetness, then this coconut genoise cake should be something that's right for you. Paired with pineapple relish, passion fruit, and orange sorbet, this soft and moist coconut cake will whisk your senses away to a lovely tropical destination in Southeast Asia. That's all the time we have for this week's episode. If you want to find out more about what we have introduced, remember to check out our website. In the coming weeks, continue to enjoy all the beautiful things in life with us. Besides discovering restaurants that serve nutritious, healthy, yet delicious food, we'll also help you strike that cool yoga pose, even if you're a first-timer. So join us for a nice stretch. And let's indulge in a succulent and perfectly cooked steak dinner. 
Join us again next time.